today we are debating whether or not we vote for Biden or no Biden, and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a great one, folks, as we welcome Destiny and Kim Iverson with us today for an exciting discussion and where it won't really discuss Trump as much. This will be more about Biden today, in particular, whether we ought to vote for Biden or not. And so, want to let you know a couple of things up front. Here at Modern Day Debate, we are a nonpartisan channel striving to host debates in which everybody gets their case to make their shot on an equal playing field, and that's on topics of science, politics, and religion. So we are very excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. want to let you know about today's format. It's going to go like this. Basically a 5 to 10 minute opening statement from each side, followed by open conversation for about 50 to 60 minutes, and then Q&A. So if you happen to have a question, feel free to shoot it into the live chat. And Super Chat is also an option. If you do that, you can also make a comment toward one or both of the speakers that they, of course, would get a chance to respond to, and it'll bump your question or comment to the top of the list for that Q&A. want to let you know, of course, we really appreciate our speakers being here. They're just doing this because they love ideas and they love conversing. And so any Super Chats that are trying to be personal attacks or anything like that, we're not going to read them, and you're not getting a refund. You're just going to have to deal with it, folks, because sometimes we get those, you know, the controversial issues. But we are very excited. This is going to be a lot of fun, folks. want to let you know a couple of other quick things coming up. In particular, if you have not heard yet, just wanted to mention, this is something that we had plugged the other day with the Milo debate, and want to be sure that you'd heard about it if you haven't. I'm showing a picture of Caitlin right now, and Caitlin had reached out to me, and she had basically said, hey, uh, I basically have a, a brain degeneration disease that we had just found out about, and she is experiencing things like tremors, as well as kind of memory lapses and other things, and so right now she has a huge low of medical bills and so we thought hey what an opportunity let's just help her get the word out and so want to let you know folks I have linked Caitlin's video where she tells her personal story so you can hear that straight from her as well as her GoFundMe down in the description folks highly encourage you even if everybody gave just a buck one dollar that would be hundreds and frankly probably thousands potentially even tens of thousands of dollars that would be going to her so we really do our heart does go out to you caitlin we hope you're doing well and with that want to mention for today's debate it will basically be Kim going first, followed by Destiny, and want to mention last, before we do get the ball rolling, I have linked both of our guests in the description. So if you're listening and you're like, hmm, I want to hear more, well, you can hear more. Click on Destiny and Kim's links in the description so that you can hear plenty more. And so with that, I want to say first, just before we do get the ball actually rolling, thank you so much, Destiny and Kim, just for hanging out with us. It's a pleasure to have you. Our pleasure, and I am just going to quick make a tweak right now for the desktop audio. Thanks for your patience, folks. And with that, can we do, uh, we did have one little switch since we went live, that's strange, is if you're uh, able to just say a quick hello, just so I can see that the audio is coming through again. Okay, give me one second. So sorry, you guys. It's been a, a challenge. This should do it, I think. Thanks for your patience. We're on the road, folks. So you can notice that our, our little studio setup is a little different than normal. Maybe I don't know if you noticed, noticed in chat, but people in your chat are saying that they can't hear her. Absolutely. Just fixed it. Can't so hear me. We've, okay, gotcha. Now we are set, so they can hear you. We, had a, we have a 30-second latency, so the live chat will catch up, and I can see it. Now we are set. Thanks for that feedback. And But, yeah, we really are stoked to have you guys. And, Kim, the floor is all yours. They can hear you loud and clear now. Okay, so I am one of those progressives who refuses to vote for Joe Biden. And I have uh, three pretty, three reasons really, 
three big reasons why I refuse to vote for Biden. Um, the first reason is that I think that uh, Biden in the White House would be a restoration of neoliberal policies. And those neoliberal policies are what gave us Trump to begin with, that Trump is just a symptom, not the disease, and that we need to focus on fixing the disease before we make it worse. And an ushering in of those neoliberal policies would make it worse. Um, secondly, one reason why I won't vote for Joe Biden is because I believe that when Democrats get in office, they become complacent and lazy. And it would be the death of the progressive movement. Somebody like myself, who's very uh, fiercely progressive, really wanting to see progressive change in this country. I think when Democrats get into office, what happens is they say, when neoliberal Democrats get into office, they say, oh, see, this is what works. This is what wins. This is what the people want. They don't want your progressive policies. They don't want your Medicare for all. What they want is they want somebody in the middle, Joe Biden or anybody else who's a neoliberal Democrat is in the middle. This is what people want. And they sort of breathe a sigh of, uh, you know, fresh air and they just say, OK, uh, this is what is this. This is what works. So we're going to stick with it. And effectively, the progressive movement loses steam. And the last reason why I won't vote for Joe Biden, and I think it's actually my biggest reason right now, is I don't think he's mentally competent. And which is unfortunate, it's not his fault. He's an older man. When people get older, we all experience various different symptoms of aging. His lack of mental capacity to me is a serious one. And why it's so serious to me is I don't think he's really going to be the one in control. I don't think I'm really voting for Joe Biden. I think I'm voting for some puppet master who's behind the scenes and who's actually the one making all of the decisions. And that person should run for office if that person wants to be president of the United States. To me, it's fundamentally anti-democratic to vote somebody in who's ultimately going to be a puppet for whoever is the puppet master. And I think that was sort of the big argument against Trump for a long time was, oh, he's Vladimir Putin's puppet. And we're really, Vladimir Putin is in control of the country. I have that same sort of fear with Joe Biden, except I don't know who's behind the curtain. I don't know who the, you know, who the Wizard of Oz is. And that to me is uh, fundamentally anti-democratic, which is why I cannot vote for Joe Biden. You got it. Thank you very much. Appreciate that from Kim. And want to let you know, folks, I, in case you had not seen... I had posted the link for Kim's live stream as they're doing a simul stream over at their channel. I, some people were saying that they couldn't see it, but I'm 100% sure I can see it. And so I put that link in the live chat. I'll put it back in there. We'll kick it over to Destiny. Thrilled to have you, Destiny. Your good buddy Vosh is here watching. If you hadn't noticed, we're excited. Uh, the floor is all yours, Steven. Yeah, um... I have like a big thing written out for an opening statement, but it mainly has to do with Biden over Trump. So I guess I'll just focus my response on, on, on I guess, the statement that you brought up and then we can kind of go into there. Um, for the three big reasons not to vote for Biden, um, I hear like the neoliberal boogeyman is kind of wheeled out a lot in terms of things we want to get rid of. I'm, I'm super curious to get into what neoliberal policies we want to get rid of. Are we talking about getting rid of like free trade? Um, are we talking about getting rid of like capitalism or like i'm really curious i, I hear people new like wheel out like are, are we getting rid of like multilateral trade agreements are we get like when we say neoliberal policies i really want to know what we're going to get rid of here or what we need to get rid of and i'm also super curious how whatever fear we have of neoliberalism exists i'm really curious how biden would be worse on that front than trump would be um who seems to be i guess if you are super neoliberal in some ways you know gives you a lot of what you want you know big corporate tax cuts um you know renegotiated multilateral trade deals between um canada and Mexico. So yeah, that I'll be really interested to hear that. Um, the second part, when Democrats get in office, they become complacent and lazy. I don't think this is true. I think this just comes from, I hear this a lot. I think it just comes from like a fundamental misunderstanding of how the electoral process works. Um, you know, a, a lot of progressive people look at Obama's administration, like, why didn't Obama do this? Why didn't Obama do this? Um, the president can only do so much, um, especially if he doesn't have a Congress for six years that supports his agenda. There's not really anything the president can do, say, for executive order, which when he could, he did. You know, We got DACA via executive order. We got things like the Iranian nuclear deal that was negotiated under Obama's administration. But when you look at things like, we're a single-payer health care. I mean, the ACA was the most we could get under Congress at the time. I, like that's it. There's I don't know what else Obama could have done there. You, you know, aside from murdering members of Congress and, and, and like getting special elections held or something. Um, that's just the, how the political process goes. 
Um, the third point is a, a little disappointing. Um, we, can, we can't really talk much about Biden's mental competency. I mean, we can go by meme clips that we see online to assume he has Alzheimer's or is, has mental deficits or problems. Um, I mean, I can bring up the fact that he has a stutter. I don't know how much people will care about that. Um, I could bring up Trump's own apparent mental decline. I don't know how much people care about that, but that's kind of like a harder thing to talk about. We talk about how it's fundamentally anti-democratic to vote in someone um, like Biden. I mean, he's won the democratic processes, so it seems to be the most democratic thing and that most people appear to support him. Uh, even if we were voting on cabinets alone, I think a Biden cabinet and a Biden vice president is probably going to be vastly superior to a Trump cabinet, whatever that is at any point in time, because it's constantly changing, or a Trump um, vice president, which would be Mike Pence. So, yeah. Um, I guess those are my, my three kind of responses to those points, and then we can kind of get into it, I guess. You bet. We'll kick it right into the open discussion. So the floor is all yours. Um, well, so I, I guess it feels like the I don't know if the first, this whole thing might devolve into a philosophy debate between is not voting for Trump or Biden the same as endorsing the other person that wins, because that seems to be a point of contention a lot of people have, where they right. think, oh, well, if I vote a third party, that's not the same as me supporting the winner in an election. Do you agree with that? Do I agree that not? So I plan to vote third party. So you, are you saying I, I don't agree that voting third party means a vote for Trump? Not necessarily a vote for Trump, but it's a vote for the winner if the only realistic option is second place. Right. If, if so, for instance, let's say one candidate is getting 100 votes, another candidate is getting 95 votes, and then a third party is getting five votes. And then let's right. say we have 10 votes left to divvy up. If you vote for the five vote person, you're essentially saying the 100 vote person gets to win. Yeah, I mean, I just think a vote is a vote is a vote. So whoever we choose to vote for is who we're voting for. If that means that somebody else who gets more votes than who I voted for wins, then that to me is democracy. That's the way it works. So, um, I, you know, I understand that argument from the viewpoint that America should be or, you know, is and should be and should remain a two party duopoly. But many of us don't want a two party system. And so many of us feel like there should be many more options. And in a system where there are more options, then you just cast your vote for who you like. And hopefully that person gains enough votes to win. But if they don't, they don't. That's the way the process works. Um, so, I mean, we can take that approach, uh, a vote is a vote is a vote, I guess in a vacuum can, can be like one way to look at it. But the reality of the situation is that if you have the ability to sway an election with third party votes and you opt not to, you're essentially tacitly endorsing the winner of the election. Um, you can say that it's for like a greater um, moral compulsion to vote third party, but from a pragmatic level, like, I mean, that's just, that's kind of how the cookie crumbles, right? Well, it only crumbles that way because so many of us are unwilling to vote for a third party. So if America, you know, there are more options on the ticket than just the two. And if more Americans decided to vote for who they really wanted, um, or, you know, maybe they don't want these third party options, but let's just say they do, they just are afraid to vote for those third party options because they're afraid of the spoiler effect. Um, you know, if Americans could kind of get out of that mindset, then we would have a return to a time that was more akin to when Lincoln w was running for president. There was actually four different options on the ticket that were large options, you know, viable potential options, um, or even just back to the time of, of Teddy Roosevelt when he ran in the Bull Moose Party against um, Taft and Woodrow Wilson. You know, we could potentially go back to these times if more Americans were willing to vote and uh, for a third party rather than say, oh, we're in a, we're in a two-party system and so we have to just fall in line to that. So, I mean, I understand the argument of, well, we, but realistically we're in a two-party system, so this is what you're doing. But my contention to that is realistic, we were not actually in a two-party system. We just have fallen into one, but we can also get ourselves out of it if more Americans were willing to vote uh, the way that they want versus the way they think they need to for the lesser of two evils. Okay, so I mean, we started with it, it crumbles that way because people refuse to vote for third party. So we do agree then that third parties essentially just serve to spoil the election for the, the, the runner up if that third party vote would have gone to the runner up. Right um, now, yeah, in time, yeah. right now, well, that could so change tomorrow. The only way that could conceivably change in the United States is if we change the electoral process. For instance, we have to get rid of first past the post. Um, with first past the post, just the way that it's set up mathematically, the only possible thing that can happen is two parties like being successful. So it seems like if we're like really, um, if we're really 
dug into getting third party or like coalition type governments set up, um, multiple parties working together, it seems like we would have to change the 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 voting system. Like I don't I don't see how we could ever have multiple parties, more than two parties running, if we have first past the vote post as our voting system. Well, I mean, what first pass? What getting rid of that and having like. Uh, um... Uh, gosh, I, it's just completely lost on me the name of it. What, is, what do they ranked do in Maine? Choice ranked one. choice, right? In yeah. Maine, they do ranked choice voting. Um, you know, going to something like ranked choice voting would certainly help in order to restore third party and fourth party options in America, but it's not necessary in order to do it. The reason why the first past the post system makes it to where we end up in a two party system is because people are afraid of the spoilers. So they don't like the fact that, you know, I mean, one guy gets all the votes or one more vote than somebody else and therefore they win the election. And so people feel like they have to rally all together and coalesce in these coalitions essentially um, and it, it kind of forms this by default two-party system, but I don't, I don't, it's not necessary. It certainly would help calm the fears of spoiler voting, but it's not necessary. Um, we could do a third party without that if people just got over the fear. Okay, so I'm 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 gonna push back on this until the day I die. So the the pro the reason why this doesn't work is I'm gonna use traditional parties as examples. Let's say that we have a Democratic Party that is generally um, okay on environmental issues, a Republican Party that refuses to acknowledge environmental issues, and then a Green Party whose single purpose is environmental issues. Right. If you are big on environmental issues, you're more likely to align with the Democrats than the Republicans, and the Green Party might be your perfect party. Let's say that we live in a world where there are 60% of Americans that support environmental issues and 40% of Americans that are against environmental issues. If all 40% of those people have a singular party to unify behind the Republican Party, and then the Democratic Party and the Green Party split those 60% of Americans' votes, maybe 35-25 um, or maybe 30-30, then those two parties, the third party, is always serving to spoil their interests by taking voters away from the other party that most likely resembles their point of view, allowing the other party um, that stands in opposition to their views to win. Third parties under a first past the post system just mathematically will always and consistently spoil the election. There's no way to get over that as long as the other side is willing to unify. The only way a first past the post system gets us multiple parties is if the other side also has a third party spoiler that spoils in equal proportions as, as the side that, that you're on. That's like mathematically it just doesn't work. It can't like. Right. Well, that's because you're talking about a third party specifically that branches off away from one of those other two parties. So for example, if the Libertarian Party were to grow really, really large, then they would be the spoiler for the Republican Party. And the Green exactly. Party is more liberal. So they end up being a spoiler because they end up being more of a fringe. What we have right now is a lot of the third party options are like fringe, um, more of the extreme mentality for the two different more centrist parties, right? So the Libertarian is more extreme on the Republican side and the Green Party is more extreme on the liberal side. So mm -hmm. they do act as spoilers, but that is isn't that is just that type of third party. There could potentially be... Uh, you know, and this is real hypothetical because we don't have one right now, but a, there really could be potentially a third party that rises up that is actually taking from both parties equally. And in which case it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be a spoiler. They would just cause the other two parties to lose. The, like, it's possible, but that's like so fantastical. I can't even imagine a third party like rising from nothing. And like, there are ways to do this, but third parties never seem very invested in actually doing this. Like the way to actually grow a third party in the United States, it seems like the most successful way to do it would be to grow within like one of your current political parties. So for instance, like- um, And then you'd be a spoiler. Also, um, well, if you're a spoiler, then all you do is you hurt your side more, right? And right you so just, you wouldn't want to do that. That's why they don't. That's why they don't end up forming parties. What they do is they just form, they form uh, caucuses. Sure. Um, but like having some sort of local representation with some of these third parties would, would probably help in terms of growing that way. So getting congressmen elected from your third party across the country or, um, you know, maybe more local levels like state representatives or city council officials or whatever would probably be ways to grow. But in terms of like a national like presidential election, like there's no way that a third party just rises up out of nowhere and manages to equally siphon votes in the left and right and gets like 35 percent of the American vote or 40 percent and takes out the other two. Like this just seems like an unbelievable I, I, I guess like maybe in the future it could be fathomable, but right now, like as a third party vote, like you're, it seems like you're just tossing your vote into the wind in the hopes that in the future at some point people might feel a little bit differently about third party votes. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that right now this election, because we don't have really a viable third party option that's big enough to to gain enough votes. You know, I understand the the argument for this particular election that me voting for a third party, whoever that might be, I haven't made a decision yet, um, that that is essentially just throwing my vote away, I guess. I mean, the democratic process is I get to vote for whoever I want to vote for. Um, I, I would say that if you're voting for the loser, I mean, I could I could make an argument that, well, Trump's going to win. Uh, so, you know, if I were a Republican, right, I'd be like, oh, Trump's going to win. You're crazy. Of course, he's going to win. He's going to win by a landslide. And then I'd say, so your vote for Biden is just throwing a vote away. You should vote for Trump because he's going to ultimately win. I mean, we, we just don't operate like that. We say we vote for who we stand for, who we want. And um, but going back to your point, I think what you're really trying to, what your your ultimate point in bringing up these third party options and everything is saying that if I me voting third party is throwing my vote away when I could instead vote for Biden and, and vote for somebody who I align more with than the other guy in hopes that the other guy doesn't win, because if the other guy wins, then I for sure lose because I don't align I, because I align less with that guy than the other guy. But my problem is I don't align more with Biden than I do with Trump. That's one of my fundamental problems. So not only is Biden those three things that I've listed as to why I won't vote for him, um, but there's it goes deeper than that as well, which is just I don't align with him as I align with Trump on some things more than Biden. And on in some ways, I think Trump is further left than Biden. And in, in other ways, Biden is further left than Trump. So to me, it's, you know, that what then they're almost a wash. Then on top of it, what makes me say, okay, I definitely won't vote for Biden is the fact that I think it will, uh, it, it will stall the progressive movement. It'll be just one of those things that the neoliberals will be able to say, look, you guys lost twice. Bernie Sanders didn't win the election, uh, the nomination against Hillary Clinton. He couldn't win it against Joe Biden. And this is what works. This is what people want. You, you progressives just get lost. And, you know, and then on top of it, what I mentioned with, I just don't know who's really going to be running that presidency, who's really going to be running the White House. And, you know, those things are really, uh, so those kind of top off, when I look at the two of them, to me, they're almost the same. Um, they're, uh, they're different in certain ways. I think Biden is better for things like the environment, but not by a whole lot. And Trump, I think, is better a little bit on foreign policy maybe not by a whole lot. It just kind of depends. Um, trade, you know, neoliberal policies, I really think are what gave us Trump. Trump is a symptom of a bigger disease. Americans are feeling like the, the middle class is dwindling. The elites are getting richer. The poor are getting poor. The middle class is dwindling. And those policies that, the policies that allowed that to happen, happened to really stem down to, they, they boil down to free trade agreements. Um, and I am not a socialist, so let's just put that out there. I, I am for a mixed economy, a healthy blend of capitalism and socialism. I'm very much in favor of a Nordic model system, which is a capitalist, a compassionate capitalism, whatever you want to call it. But definitely these free trade agreements that really started to ramp up in the 70s and then definitely under Clinton, I think those, and, and they've continued on, and these neoliberals that have wanted to continue on these policies, they have just offshored jobs and made it much more difficult for the working class American to achieve the American dream. And I think Trump's inner, you know, his uh, more protectionist I would say he's not isolationist, but I would say he's more protectionist. His protectionist policies help to, at least if they're not working right now, and they very well might not be, um, at least they're shining a light on the problem. At least he's attempting to address the actual problem. So, you know, I care a lot about the environment. Uh, I myself am like a bona fide certified environmentalist. I've done work in, in the environmental movement, but uh, more than anything else, but and I, but I also don't think Biden's going to do that much to, uh, I don't know how much a presidency can really do when it comes to the environment. I think actually the market will sort of settle the environment a little bit more than the presidency will. But foreign policy is a big one, right? I mean, these guys, 80% of their job, if not more, is foreign policy. And I do think Trump is to the left of Biden on foreign policy in some, some major areas. Not all. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I'm going to give a response and then 
I think we should move point by point. There's a lot being said here. Um, so, it, so we open up with I don't I don't. So you, you say that you align more with Biden than Trump, but almost on every single example, I just can't understand. So this statement that Trump is further left than Biden, I only hear this said by like the most insane socialists and then random people that I don't know what their definition of, of left or right is. Um, especially combined with your later statement of being in favor of the, the Nordic model system. Like, I don't understand how we can ever think that Trump is more closely aligned with that than Biden is. Like, Biden wants to quadruple federal spending on low-income housing. Like, he wants to triple spending on low-income uh, K-12 through schooling. Um, he wants to double Pell Grants, right, making education more affordable to people. He's talking about, like, a massive expansion of the ACA, giving a public option available to all Americans, which more closely resembles, like, a universal health system in any Nordic country compared to what we have in the U.S. right now. Trump, like, the Republicans literally just defunded the ACA and said, good luck. We've got nothing, <laughs> like nothing to replace that dismantling of the ACA. Um, Biden's talking about a hundred billion dollar investment in affordable housing. You know, when we talk about houses being affordable to people, you know, like Sweden guarantees that everybody can sign up to, on a list for a house when they turn 18 or whatever, that list is fucking long. Um, you know, uh, $10 billion set aside in Biden's administration for um, transit projects in high, in, in, uh, in high poverty areas. Like nothing nothing here is under Biden's system Biden, or I'm sorry is under Trump's system you know Trump for education has talked about like school vouchers which historically have like never served the interests of poor people charter schools in the US I don't I'd, like barely even beat public schools I think in terms of outcome um, this we get this weird comment also sometimes where it's like oh like a, a getting a Democrat elected will stall the progressive movement how Biden's administration and his suggestions are some of the most progressive we've ever had. Like, especially when you talk about environment stuff, environmental stuff earlier, like Biden has got like one of the most aggressive environmental plans that we've ever seen of like any White House administration ever, any incoming president ever, assuming that he wins. Um, Bernie himself, his cabinet has worked or his uh, team of people have worked with Biden to come out with these plans um, that are supposed to be way better for the environment than anything we would ever see out of, out of a, a, a Trump team. Um, this idea of like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Like you just described all of Trump's tax cuts, like more disproportionately more money going to wealthier people, the poor not really getting as much, you know, look at how much of a struggle, how much of a fight it's been just to get checks sent out to people that Trump is just having his name written on. Um, look at how the, the PPP worked, how all of these businesses got these massive bailouts, but it's so hard to get a $1,300 cash transfer to Americans, you know, and I've seen you and other people included keep floating with this idea that like, oh, you know, Trump maybe is going to go UBI. He's not. That's a joke. He just says it to get a little bit of support for a while and it doesn't happen. You know, we talk about trade and the evil of multilateral trade agreements, you know, Trump jerks off is the, the USMCA, that the, the new NAFTA that he signed over and over again. Nothing in that helped to protect more American jobs. Like it was basically a reformation of NAFTA with, with slightly harsher provisions. Like for instance, for automobiles manufactured, instead of 62.5% of the parts being manufactured in North America, now it's 75% of parts. Or it, I think like it demanded like wages of Mexicans or other workers being boosted to like 16 an hour instead of, you know, whatever they normally make. Um, but, you know, despite all of the uh, uh, jobs that may be created in the United States, none of those are created for working class people those manufacturing jobs aren't coming back detroit and and all of these like big manufacturing cities aren't gaining all these working class jobs it's engineers getting these jobs to manufacture and make robots that make vehicles like all of those traditional old jobs aren't coming back and even if they were we're not getting the types of protections that we would need for those jobs to come back because trump's administration doesn't really support things like an increase in the minimum wage or strengthening of unions both things that biden's administration supports both things that are historically anti-neoliberal and both things that would most closely align us with like nordic countries um i I don't understand how like any part, um, even your statement of like the market will probably be the one to settle environmental issues um, over the government. That's something that I agree with, but one thing the government can do is direct the market. So for instance, one of the only policies that has ever been shown to have a positive impact market-wise on climate change is cap and trade systems like taxing carbon. And that's something that a presidential administration can do. That's something that the EPA has the ability to do. Um, Trump doesn't even believe that climate change is real. Uh, I, I don't, we're never going to see any like serious combating uh, of, of Trump um, or of climate change coming from Trump's administration. And then foreign policy being 80% of the job of the president. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I guess maybe on a strict level, it maybe could be, maybe might be, but that's foreign policy is not the thing that Americans care the most about. But if we were to grade a president on foreign policy, I mean, Trump has legitimized Kim Jong-un as a leader, has pulled out of a historic agreement that prevented Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. has damaged relationships with the, with Iraq by the assassination of Soleimani without running it by them at all, um, has you know literally bombed Syria, which is something I know a lot of people people historically were against, um, has said he was going to pull troops out of Afghanistan and hasn't done so yet. They're still there. And I think they've even talked about potentially increasing our presence there. Uh, I, like, I, I don't understand where the foreign policy argument, he's damaged relationships with leader, leaders around the world. He's threatened to cut funding to, um, to, um, 
uh, not NAFTA, NATO, over and over and over again because he doesn't even understand what the purpose of NATO is. Um, he has lost his um, point. Lost is it, forgive me, Dustin, because I know that Kim also made a lot of different points, and so I, pardon my interruption. Oh, yeah, sorry, okay, I'm wrapping it up. Sorry, yeah, because I'm, I'm just writing down, like, everything she said so I can respond to every single point. Uh, and, and then, like, um, yeah, it has undermined, like, American presence around the world. Like, leaders, like, famously, like, Merkel and, and Trudeau, like, have said things like, oh, we're losing confidence in American leadership, and the world is losing confidence in American leadership. And, yeah, that was my, yeah. Um, okay, if we want to go point by point, that's cool, but if, if she says, like, a lot of stuff, I, I usually I have to write everything down or respond to it, otherwise I'm just kind of getting, like, yeah, ran over. That's okay, fair. So. No problem. I think what we'll do is probably if we switch into uh, maybe one point at a time, and I know that that's a challenge, Kim, because I know that there are a lot of points that Destiny had said that you'd probably like to respond <laughs> to each and every one of them, but don't worry. I promise that given that people know that we'll switch to point to point, I, I know that they'll know that you have a rebuttal ready for these points, but we uh, just to kind of keep it more manageable, cognitively speaking, we'll uh, kind of go maybe if maybe one of the points that you especially disagree with Destiny uh, from those last several. I, I mean, I definitely especially disagree with foreign policy, that foreign policy is 80 percent of the job of the presidency. Everything else, a president has to work with Congress. Um, for many of the many of the in order to push through legislation or to get things done. I mean, I know that presidents have more and more used the power of the executive order, but um, that is something that many of us Americans contest, maybe shouldn't be used as often, that instead Congress needs to begin legislating. I know that the Supreme Court has even been admonishing Congress saying, why are we legislating from the bench? We don't wanna be doing this. You guys need to be getting your, your acts together. So um, really the fundamental job of the president is, you know, it used to be prior to the 70s, the president would balance the budget, but then Congress essentially took that big, uh, that big task off the president's table. And now they're the ones that really manage more of that. So foreign policy, I think, is fundamentally a president's job. That's where they have way more unilateral power. And when it comes to foreign policy, I guess it depends on, um, you know, typically for me, somebody on the left is somebody who wants more uh, peace and negotiation with world powers, wants to facilitate, um, you know, conversation with others, even if you don't agree with them, you don't necessarily have to agree with people in order to listen to them and to want to have a meeting with them and talk to them. Um, less war, obviously, is something that people typically on the left have always been asking for and, and advocating for. And Trump is a very, uh, you, you know, it's, it's definitely could be debated because as he got into office, things have shifted a bit, but he's definitely more of an anti-interventionist than other presidents have been, or even, pres or even what Biden says he's going to be. For example, it was just, was it last week that Trump mentioned he would be willing to sit down with Maduro to end the conflict that has been escalating in Venezuela to to sit down and have a discussion with the guy he says i'm always open to meetings you know this is the same thing with kim jong-un president trump says i'm always open to meetings i don't see any problem with meetings um and he's now saying hey i'll, I'll i'd be willing to meet with maduro meanwhile biden then comes back around and says oh you know how dare you this is terrible if you care about humanitarian eff efforts and and human rights you would never sit down with that brutal dictator and that is a been, question about yeah, that yeah like so like this is so strange to me. Like when we say that Trump would be willing to meet with Maduro, that's because Trump's support of the second declared Venezuelan president, um, Juan um, Guaido. Guido, yeah, Guaido, yeah, failed. Like Trump, hold on. Okay, sorry. Trump literally invited the guy that declared himself president of Venezuela to the American White House to legitimize him as the new president of Venezuela. How can right. we say that Trump is supporting peace in that region? Like that bid for his, um, that bid for his his power failed. So now Trump is like, okay, sure. Well, now I'll support like Maduro. But this was literally regime change. Well, I would that be was shocked a, that if was... Biden did this. You would be calling this an attempted coup from a Democrat side. Well, that it was bipartisan. It was completely bipartisan. I mean, you saw Juan Guaido when he was at the State of the Union address. All of them stood up. I mean, that was like the one time Nancy Pelosi decided to clap during Trump's speech. We're not talking and about gave a standing bipartisan. ovation. We're talking about it Trump. was by Guaido is bipartisan. So all of them have matter. supported Guaido. When Biden gets into office, he's going to support Guaido. It's going to be regime change. Trump at least will back down from it. When he says, yeah, you know what? I didn't like that. I did, it wasn't working. Uh, I changed my mind. 
you know, and that to me is more appreciated than a president that's going to go in there and hard line it and say, no, this is what we're going to do. I don't think had Hillary Clinton been in office, for example, that we would have been withdrawing from Syria the way that we did. I think she would have remained in Syria. I don't think she would have sat down to do the first peace deal agreement with the Taliban ever. I don't think she would have gone down that road. I don't think she would have sat down with Kim Jong-un to try to de-escalate tensions. I don't think she would be turning around right now and saying, oh, Juan Guaido, you know what? Uh, we're going to just ditch this guy because that's not working. That's clearly not something Ven Venezuela is going for. And I guess we need to start sitting down and having conversations with Maduro. Sure, like, I don't well, believe so, those things would happen. Yeah, maybe not. But all of none of these things are good for Trump. So for Trump and Maduro, Trump attempted a coup in Venezuela and failed. And now he's like, OK, well, I'll support um, I'll support Maduro. I don't think that's a point for Trump, whether or not whether or not that is bipartisan support of Congress is relevant. We're not talking about the Democrats. We're talking about Trump right now. Right. That, so. I don't think that's a point for well, Trump, Trump that he actually, attempted to go in. Fact, wait, wait, real quick. And, and then, because you, you also brought up the Taliban and Kim Jong-un, okay? The, the, we signed a deal with the Taliban saying we're just going to leave Afghanistan because screw it, we can't do anything and just leave, which is essentially handing the country over to the Taliban. Like anybody yeah, They're the government gonna, now. Yes, they're the government. We sure. have to. And then it. we've been at war for 20 years. We lost. We sure. have to go. I understand, but I don't. I don't know if that's a point for Trump's foreign policy. Like, okay, well, I'm leaving. Also, we still have a huge presence in Afghanistan. That hasn't happened yet. And then thirdly, when you bring up Kim Jong Un, we didn't secure a single concession whatsoever in that region from Kim Jong Un. They still continue to test missiles. All of our allies in the region, Japan and South Korea, like look to America. Like, what are you guys doing? We went to Kim Jong Un. We legitimized him as a leader, and then we walked away, and we didn't secure a single concession. How is what that a foreign policy win? What do you think we should have done? What do you think we should have done with Kim Jong Un? Well, we could have ordered. Um, I, I mean, we could have. We could look to the Iran deal for how we should have structured an agreement with them. Maybe we have it so that investigators are allowed to go on site in North Korea and investigate certain uh, reactors. Maybe we have it in place such that if you continue to test intercontinental ballistic missiles, maybe we are going to enact stronger sanctions on you. Um, maybe we order the decommissioning of certain nuclear facilities. We like There's tons of things we could have done. We could look to Obama's deal with Iran, um, something that Trump walked away from as like a model for how we should have approached nuclear I think that's what Trump was trying, trying to do with Kim Jong-un, if I am not mistaken. I think he was trying Tried to negotiate failed. a deal. Right, and because failed, Kim Jong-un's unwilling. So Kim Jong-un, you, you, know, you have to negotiate with somebody else. If that other person's not willing, what are you going to do? Not so legitimize them on the world stage. So then what? You have to negotiate with them. How are you going to negotiate with that? How are you going to do an Iran nuclear deal with North Korea without actually sitting down with them? Well, how are you going to get that done? The, the best way to You're probably going do to it. threaten war. No, you don't have to threaten war. You use soft power. We have a lot of soft political power that the United States is unwilling to use because Trump is unwilling to engage in multilateral trade agreements and instead prefers to do unilateral trade agreements. If we don't like what North Korea is doing, maybe getting China to apply some pressure on them is possible. But we can apply. We, we no, tried. we don't try because the way to apply pressure on China is not unilaterally, it's through multilateral trade agreements, something that Trump historically has been opposed to. If you want to apply pressure to China, then these sanctions have to come from a wide variety of countries. It can't just right. be the United States that does it. We don't have the economic power to apply that power to China anymore. So if you really want to deal with North Korea, you probably have to go the route with China, but China is, a, is way too big for the US to deal with alone. And this protectionist idea, this go it alone policy where we refuse to engage with other countries to apply like multilateral pressure to China means that we're never going to have the ability to do it. Regardless Regardless of how we think we should approach North Korea, what Trump did was just horrible. It did nothing. It, it put, took us steps back from it. And to yeah, cite I mean, that as a, as a foreign agree. policy, I, I don't agree. I think that leader. I think our president should meet with leaders of other countries. These these leaders are in control of the lives of millions of people. And to say, oh, it legitimizes them. They're already legitimate, whether you like it or not. Millions of people are under their control. That's pretty damn legitimate. So we've got to be able to sit down with these people and say, hey, listen, you know, let's try to work something out to where we're de-escalating tensions. We are. Uh, you know, you don't threaten us with nukes. Don't threaten us. You know, let's try to try to keep the peace a bit here. I don't know what else you can do. I mean, this whole idea of de or of legitimizing that to me, it, how can you like? Of course, they're already legitimate. They're already leading these nations. It's like the Taliban. They're already legitimate, whether you like it or not. They're in control of large swaths of Afghanistan. They're in control of millions of people's lives. That's legitimate. That's legitimate. What did, what did what did Trump do? What did we accomplish positively in our meeting with Kim Jong Un? Well, de-escalated tensions. I really think that Kim Jong Un, I mean, at least is less likely to bomb us now that he thinks Trump's his friend. He literally, like the next week, was spinning up centrifuges again and testing missiles. How yeah, can he you already say that we had nukes because they've already had nukes. They've had okay. nukes for a while. They've had nukes since Obama, and that I is something that you know. That's why Obama says to Trump, the, the, "Your biggest threat is North Korea." And it's because they already have their hands on nukes. 
So, so if they've already got them, what can you do now? All you can do is try to get them to dismantle them. Why would they do that when they see what we do, march around the world and try to affect regime change? We're not, we're not, not talking about it. So affect regime change, like supporting the other- They're not giving up their in Venezuela, because that's yeah. what Trump has done. Trump supported- Well, he, he attempted it under Bolton, right? But then he got rid of Bolton because he realized Bolton was an absolute big old war hawk and part of the establishment. I mean, one Have of the biggest problems that Trump has faced getting into office is that he's unfortunately surrounded by career by career officials. Those are and his picks. You can't blame- Trump some of the picks, a businessman. Right. His, you can't blame Bolton wasn't put there by like the deep state, right? That's true, right? If well, if these well, are we Trump's- don't know. We don't know. If, then it sounds like I mean, Trump, Trump is an ineffective leader. Like, well, it, I mean, there's no doubt about that, but there's also no doubt that Joe Biden would be worse when it comes to foreign policy. Sure, he but, absolutely would be affecting regime change in Venezuela. It'd be one of the first things he does is ensure that Juan Guaido gets into power. He would once again ensure that more troops end up in Syria because we got to defeat Assad. I don't think he'd be pulling out of the uh, out of Afghanistan with the Taliban. Instead, he might be ramping it up, leading us into what another decade of war in Afghanistan. We have lost. They've won. We have to just suck it up, stick our tail between our legs, and go home. That's what oh, we like. Every every point you're the bringing, only where these, okay. 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 One, only sec, one, one sec. One sec. One sec. For, forgive me for yeah. just jumping in. We'll give. Uh, let's give Stephen a chance to respond. I promise it, we'll come right back to you, Kim. I, I just like all of these foreign policy areas you're bringing up are areas that Trump has blundered in, like massively. Like when you talk about like he would escalate tensions in Syria, Trump literally abandoned allies in Syria and literally threatened to steal oil fields in northeast Syria and run them under the United States. How is that considered a foreign policy win? And then when we talk about like creating like a successful nuclear deal for North Korea and how the United States, well, we weren't able to get concessions. Maybe one of the reasons why it's so hard to is because we literally just walked away from a perfectly good deal we had structured with Iran. Why would any other country make a deal with us to avoid nuclear weapons if the US is just gonna leave? for political reasons. Yeah, so when it comes to Iran, definitely Trump is not good. I, I think that there's two areas of foreign policy that Trump would be potentially, well, no, maybe just one area of foreign, eh, hard to say, hard to say with Israel, how Biden will respond, how what Biden's going to do in regards to Israel. But definitely when it comes to Iran, Trump has been worse on that front foreign policy wise. I don't think Biden or Democrats would be doing uh, maximum pressure sanctions on that nation. But when it when I look at all of the the rest of foreign policy all around the world, I do think that Trump has an edge on Democrats it, lately, unfortunately. I, um, I wish I could see some of those successes, but I, I mean, he got a couple more countries to contribute more to their military budget under NATO. I, I think guess even, that's... well, even just the conversation of, hey, we shouldn't be invading these countries. Hey, we shouldn't be uh, affecting regime change war, being really hesitant to affect regime change in countries like uh, like Venezuela. You know, he gave Bolton that one shot to attempt it and it failed. And now Trump has lost interest and he wants to move on. And that to me is a win, you know, ultimately it's better than continuing maximum pressure on Venezuela saying, okay, no, we're going to still go for it again and again and again until they finally collapse. Uh, sure. Um, I mean, like B Trump literally has an unprecedented thumb right now on the DOJ, on the Department of Justice. And I'm pretty sure we're, unless this case was dropped, I could be wrong. But the last I heard, we are literally prosecuting Maduro for drug trafficking charges in the United States and our federal prosecutors. So yeah. this idea that like Trump isn't trying to affect regime change, I, I don't understand. I just don't don't get it. Well, um, affecting regime change is a little bit different than trying to pressure somebody to, I mean, like actual pressuring of, of trying to affect regime change through uh, messing with the electrical grid, uh, trying to stage a military coup. You know, those were things that have been attempted in Venezuela recently, these maximum sanctions. Um, but now, you know, Trump seems to have reversed and moved to a strategy of Let's just try to talk Maduro into resigning. Let's try to get him to peacefully exchange into to somebody else. But I don't think he's thinking Guaido necessarily anymore. I just don't know if that is the way that the that lately Democrats have proven to be more war hawkish. And I think that they would have gone in with more military might and would have done something like topple Maduro the same way Gaddafi was toppled, which ended up leading Libya to an, a completely failed state where we have a slave trade, an open slave market now going on in Libya. That is absolutely a disaster that happened under a Democrat. So, you know, I, uh, for- I, Like, I understand all of this, but like, if you want to be critical of, of like, 
I, I don't, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds of foreign policy discussion, or we can, but like, if you want to be critical of U.S. actions in the Middle East and the type of people that we defend or the type of people that we attack, so for instance, our really aggressive position on Iran or the 2011 involvement in the Libyan civil war, like, well, then let's take a look at some of the partners that we have in the Middle East, like, for instance, the Gulf states, like, for instance, Saudi Arabia. Trump applied zero pressure whatsoever when that, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but the journalist that got chainsawed and brought out Shoggy. in his body bag. Yeah. yeah. Trump did nothing about that. Didn't care. We've, I'm pretty sure under Trump, we've signed historic, like, multi, like, hundred billion dollar arms deals with Saudi Arabia, right? If we're going to continue to work with the Gulf states and our relationship with them is only strengthened under Trump, of course we're going to constantly be taking aggressive positions towards countries like Iran or towards leaders that don't support um, Israel or the the, um, the Gulf states down in that region of the world. And we've seen that. We're literally assassinating like people that are part of Iran's government in Iraqi airports. Like that's, in, that's huge. That's like a big, like, oh my God. You know what I'm talking about? Like war hawkish like position. That's insane. Yeah, uh, I mean, like Trump literally vetoed the, like a Senate vote to withdraw from Yemen like and we've been historically bombing them more and more and more and more even under Trump's administration I'm sorry go ahead well we support Saudi Arabia on that yeah uh, I mean look with when it comes to Iran I definitely concede that the guy is worse I, I don't well well it's hard to say it's hard to say if he's worse he's certainly not going in the direction that I would like him to go in when it comes to Iran but it's hard to say what would have happened with Iran how would we have escalated with Iran with a Demo with like Hillary Clinton in the White House? It's hard to say what would have been or what, you know, we could say what what we think might have happened, um, but events change, things are always shifting. And this is kind of what happened when Obama was in office. It was, we're gonna get out of these wars, we're gonna pull out the troops and all that, and then things change. And he says, oh, never mind. we're actually gonna ramp things up. I mean, so you just never know what happens when a person gets into the White House. So it's hard to say. But I definitely don't like the direction that Trump has gone on when it comes gone in when it comes to Iran. I think he has a real serious uh, um, alliance or blind spot or soft spot when it comes to Israel, and he basically is willing to do what Israel would like him to do, and that includes mean mugging Iran all the time to try to goad Iran into some sort of a conflict in order to um, justify trying to affect regime change in Iran again. Uh, we so don't have to. We don't have to talk about like hypothetical like we get what it what happened under obama in iran we got a historic the joint comprehensive plan of action a multilateral arms agreement that to, to decommission uh, iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons in exchange for an easing of sanctions on a badly damaged economy and a free up of funds that we had frozen that belonged to iran we like obama had taken one of the most unprecedented, unbelievable stances towards Iran in like the past like several decades of, of U.S. position towards that country. Th this idea that we would be more aggressive towards Iran under Democrats when it was literally a Republican that came in and stripped away the U.S. involvement in that deal that was a historic warming of relations between that country. Um, same thing with Cuba. The exact same thing. Was, my mom is from Cuba. Like under Obama, I think we were actually seeing flights to Cuba again as we started to, to warm up relationships with that country. And I think Trump just walked back on all of that as well. Right. Yeah. And Cuba is, you know, Cuba is one that would be interesting. I don't think Biden is going to reverse course on Cuba. I think Obama did that just because he was exiting. I think a lot of presidents get away with a lot of stuff at, their, at, the, at the last year of their off of their term. Uh, they kind of do what they want to do. And I think it was definitely the right thing to do to open up relations with Cuba. And we absolutely should go back to that for sure. I don't think Biden's going to do that. I don't think he's going to reverse course on Cuba. I think that there's just too many voters in Florida, a swing state that absolutely do not want to see normalized relations, relationships with Cuba. So I don't think that's going to change. Um, I think that's probably why Trump did what he did because he knows he needs those swing voters and you know, in Florida, Biden knows he needs them too. So I don't expect any change there. Um, so that is something I don't think would, would be any different. Venezuela, I do think would be different under Biden. I do think that our efforts in Afghanistan would be different and Syria would be different. Israel, I think, would be the same. I don't think that Biden is going to, he's been known to be one of the friendliest uh, senators when he was in the Senate with Israel. Um, and I don't think that that's going to, I don't think he's going to put any pressure on them to stop them from increasing their settlements in the West Bank or from annexing sections of the West Bank. I don't think that's going to, you know, no president really has put any pressure on Israel. So I don't think that's going to change. The only sure. thing that might be different is Iran. And I give you that. That's the one thing that very well could be different. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing about Trump is he has been unwilling to engage in full conflict with Iran. So even though he's done little things here and there, 
Uh, he's been unwilling to go full bore into war with them or to, to be so aggressive that we end up re fully in a conflict with Iran, like many of the neocons in the government would love to see. The war hawks absolutely the would love to see us march into war with Iran. And he's been holding back on that. He's not a for war president. The assassination of Soleimani has been one of right. the most aggressive things the U.S. has done in the Middle East since our invasion of the Middle East. It literally prompted some level yeah. of military response from Iran against some of our embassies. How can you say that we've taken – also, and then even looking at Cuba again, first of all, Biden has said that he's willing to return to Obama's prior you know, steps uh, prior steps that they've taken to, to warm up relationships with Cuba. Um, the only reason Trump doesn't like Cuba, the reason why in 2017 he rolled back all of those Obama-era um, travel relaxations and, and the sanction relaxations was because he was trying to pressure Cuba out of, out of supporting Maduro, regime change. Um, and the voters in Florida. I think the voters we, we in We can Florida say voters in Florida, deal. but it, it was the stated reason was because Cuba is a big supporter of Venezuela, which they are. They're very close to each other. Um, I, I, Trump Huge is like British. as hawkish as any military president like has ever been. I, like, mm. to say, I don't think people realize how important I think there was a big New Yorker write-up. Um, if, if anybody hasn't read it on who, on who Suleimani was, um, this guy is so fundamentally important to, to Iran um, and, and such a leader um, in that region of the world. Like everybody right. knew who this guy was. This guy was playing multiple sides of multiple conflicts across that entire region. And we just straight up blew his shit up in an Iraqi airport without even running it by supposedly our allies that we'd forged in the in the region after the past 20 years or whatever of the destruction I'm sure of we country. ran that by Israel. I'm sure they were all on board with that. One. I don't know or care what it has to do with Israel. I'm just saying that that was an extremely has aggressive. I'm just saying that was an extremely aggressive play from the United States that some people were wondering was going to prompt a military response that did to some extent from Iran. I'm, now, I'm not supporting one way or another um, Israel or their human rights abuses against Palestinians or any of the or I don't even support Iran and, and what Soleimani was doing in, in his um, kind of imperialist shit throughout the Middle East. But I'm just saying that to say that Trump has a good record on foreign policy when all of these examples, in my opinion, are foreign policy blunders. North Korea mm -hmm. was a blunder. Um, Venezuela has been a blunder. Cuba was a blunder. Iran was a blunder. I don't see how any of these, Afghanistan continues to be a blunder. I don't see how any of these are in support of Trump having like a good stance on foreign policy. Well, you know, I mean, he's trying to get us out of Syria. That was something that Obama escalated. Libya was something that Obama escalated. Um, you know, we, uh, so uh, Trump hasn't escalated is any real on the ground conflicts. He's been trying to wind those down. So Trump literally had US troops running Syrian oil wells for- Yeah, oil so you know, he ended up bring, so he, he took the troops out of Syria and moved them into what, Saudi Arabia. He wasn't allowed to bring them home because Congress prevented him from doing it, saying that it was gonna be detrimental to our allies. So Trump had to move them out of combat zones. He at least did move those troops out of combat zones. And then he moved some troops back. It was like 200 back to guard some oil right sure Ridiculous. i'm just saying that the but US that's still better running... it's still better to get us out of those foreign to get us out of the conflicts and to say we're just not going to be fighting these wars anymore i think that's a win that's more of a success um you know some of it, it's not like we can really exit these places overnight we do have to have an exit strategy of and course. i do think that trump has been giving us exit strategies out of these wars he has not gotten us into any new wars Sure, but I'm just saying that, like, in t well, in terms of, like, stepping up things in Syria, we absolutely did. Under Obama, yeah. like him or hate his foreign policy, we weren't running oil fields in Syria. Um, like, I, like, I've seen a little bit of your stuff. I think you, I don't know if you like um, Bashar al-Assad or what, but, like, Assad has literally himself come out and said, the U.S. is stealing our fucking oil. They're literally taking it. Like, the Kurdish people are running it. We've got hundreds of troops on the ground defending those oil fields, and we're literally fucking stealing the money from it. To say that this isn't an escalation of our policy in Syria, um, I, I don't understand how we could say that. This is, ab I mean, Obama I don't think that's escalation. I just don't think it's full-on withdrawal, right? I you mean, you don't think, so having no troops on the ground running their oil fields into having troops on the ground running oil fields that isn't a way of escalating u.s presence in in syria well i mean i they were for one they were in a the middle of a severe civil war that has largely calmed down so they're trying to reclaim areas of their country and these areas of the country were run by other factions and not by bashar al-assad so the, whether they were being run by the kurds or they're being run by isis or al-qaeda um you know, Bashar al-Assad has not had much control over his country over the last 10 years. So he's gaining control. He wants control of those oil fields back. And 
yeah, you know, the U.S. will say, no, no, wait, we're going to go and guard that oil. Hold on. You know, do I think that's right? No, but I do think that we have de-escalated in Syria. That is a good thing. We need to continue to de-escalate all throughout the Middle East. And that is, you know, the, that's got to be the priority. I don't think that under a Democrat who's controlled by the military industrial complex is going to wind down wars in the Middle East. But a Republican who definitely isn't controlled by the military industrial complex, who hasn't stepped up like our activities in Syria on multiple fronts. Like when you talk about even just from a foreign policy point of view, when you talk about Assad taking back control of his country, like Russia has been pretty key in helping uh, them right. control like stuff going on in the northern part of that country, right? Turkey shoots Russian jets out of the sky. And I mean, Turkey is a full-on U.S. ally. It doesn't seem like we're pressuring Turkey to, to knock off with any of that shit. Also, with U.S. troops on the ground, you know, supporting Kurdish people that are running those oil fields, do you think that Russia is going to be able to help Assad just step in? I mean, I, I think we've exited completely now, but like at the point, like obviously Russia wasn't able to move in and, and destroy any presence there because the U.S. literally has troops on the ground there. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I, I don't understand how this can't be seen as anything but like an escalation. This is like literally imperialism. Like this is literally like 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 we've done regime change in Iran in the past for stuff like this, like nationalizing and expropriating oil fields and oil companies running the country and then moving to be like you can't do that and then overthrowing the country for it. Um, I, I don't know. This just seems yeah. I'm not well, sure. Is Bashar al-Assad in control of Syria at this point? Majority. Um, I he think is. majority at this point. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So. I don't think it was really a regime change effort. I mean, I think that Bashar al-Assad now has control over his country. I'm Wait, not so a then fan. it wasn't a regime change effort when Obama did it? Because it was a it absolutely was a regime change effort when Obama did it. Yeah, it was. But he's still in control of the country. It failed. Yeah, it was a failure. Right, just like Venezuela is a failure on that. Just like Iran has been a failure the numerous times that we've attempted regime change in Iran. So, so we don't always a, we don't always we're not always successful at that. And Syria was one that was absolutely not successful. And uh, many were calling for continued attempts. And Trump has basically refused and said, no, you know, the guy wins. So what we're going to do is just going to go take some oil while we're here. We're going to loot the place. But that's really what we're doing at this point. We're looting the place, but we're not actually trying to take control over the country anymore. Is it great? No, it's not great, but it's better. Okay. I, I don't see that at all, but I, I mean, I think we ran this one down. So. Um, this it may be, unless you guys have any kind of last points that you'd like to cover pretty soon, including if you want to do summary statements or something like that, we could go into the Q&A otherwise. Well, sure. I guess I'm kind of, I guess one thing, um, I mean, as much, I, I like foreign policy. I think it's very interesting. I like talking about foreign policy, but the average American doesn't care at all about foreign policy. Um, like I, the top five issues that are usually pulled um, when Gallup sees what Americans care about is healthcare and national security. I guess you could say national security is kind of foreign policy, but I think it's mostly related to border stuff. Um, and then gun policy, education, and the economy. These are like the five big issues that Americans like consistently rank as their most important things, um, which is kind of the areas that I was looking at between Biden and Trump. And I, I don't know, but I, I, we brought up, you had your three points earlier. I guess we kind of got lost to the foreign policy thing. I don't know. Um, but I mean, definitely trade. I mean, I, I do agree that I think Trump is to the left of Biden when it comes to you know, uh, trade in the U.S. with foreign countries and trying to protect workers. I think that if tra if Biden gets back in, he's going to implement, you know, get into TPP and uh, he's going to stop tariffs on China. I'm not really a big fan of exactly what's going on with how we're going about the trade war with China, but I do think that it's a necessary conversation. It's a necessary point that people need to be understanding that has been uh, that that our dis our imbalance in trade with China. Now, I don't agree with the cause of it and what Trump is attacking, but I think that at least pointing it out and getting Americans to realize that this is a problem is fundamentally a good thing, rather than just sweeping it under the rug, ignoring it, and saying all is well over here, which is absolutely what Biden plans to do. I'm that to me is more of the. Of, uh, I mean, Trump's know. tariffs are literally having a 50 plus billion dollar impact that is a tax on American consumers every single year. Uh, I think that even in my state of Nebraska, I, I think they said they'd suffered a, a billion dollars in losses um, in, in terms of revenue due to the restrictions of, of the tariffs um, in the United States. Um, like, even if we do say that these tariffs are helping the U.S. establish some businesses, they're not helping workers. We're, we're not like hiring like auto workers again. These are all robots. These are all automated machines that are being created to do these manufacturing jobs. Um, 
I don't see how we Trump definitely need to bring some manufacturing back to the U.S. I mean, I think that this pandemic has made that really clear that, you know, when we are ex when we're bringing imports in for everything, including masks and sanitizers and all of these, you know, PPE gear that we need tests and materials for these tests. That has shown us that we absolutely need to restore manufacturing here in the United States to some level, just as a measure of national security. I mean, shoes are all made in China. What if we have to go to war and we all need shoes? You know, what if I, I mean, clothing, everything is made over there. And I think that this has opened, hopefully it's opened Americans' eyes to the fact that we do actually need to bring some manufacturing back to America. We do need to have some America first policy. There's no doubt China has China first policy. There's no doubt that many countries around the world do. And the US has, uh, has sort of abandoned that for the corporatists, the elites, the capitalists that want to go and just make as much money as they possibly can. We've allowed our country to go up for sale. We've put up the United States for sale. Everything is for sale in this country, including our politicians, our homes. You know, you're allowed to come into this country and buy real estate and property, even if you're not an American citizen. You cannot do that in China. There are so many things that we have just placed up for sale. We've allowed this uh, we've allowed for just anything as long as it goes to the highest bidder it's fine. And Trump has at least, I mean, it's again, it's not perfect. It definitely needs, it's far from perfect. His policies are far from perfect, but he's at least shining a light on this problem and waking Americans up to say, hey, we let ourselves go for way too long. We do need to put America first for a while. We do need to start looking at our trade imbalances and realizing that this is a giant problem. And it's causing the, it's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons of inequality in our country. The biggest reason is of course, that we've just allowed for uh, these, the, for the country to go up for sale, including the politicians. That is allowed for corporations to get away with everything. That's allowed for, uh, and Joe Biden, by the way, you know, he promised all of, he promised us that he was going to, uh, he, you know, he even put on his website this entire plan for corporate accountability legislation that he was going to finally make them uh, pay their fair share. And then he goes and he does a speech three weeks ago in front of a bunch of corporate Wall Street guys and says, nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to propose any new legislation on you. Nothing is going to fundamentally change. He said that last year, he said it again three weeks ago. So he lies. What will, what will, forgive me, just because, just to be sure that uh, Stephen gets to cover at least several points here, is that there are a number of them. And I think that Kim, since we let you get the ball rolling, uh, I mean, I've got more time if you guys do. So I don't want to end us Sorry, abruptly. Yeah, so just a real quick, um, that, that, that last, quote by Biden is like horrendously mischaracterized. You can listen to the speech. What he was basically saying was that he wasn't going to demonize rich people and that people's standards of living won't fundamentally change or whatever. He's not going to take billionaires and tax them until they have no money or some crazy shit like that. He wasn't saying that he's not going to enact um, legislation that's not going to affect wealthy people at all. He and said we that three weeks ago. Three yes. weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Yeah, he said nobody's standards of living are going to change amongst like wealthy people. He's not going to. He didn't say he wasn't going to pass any type of tax policies. Like Trump has some of the most progressive tax policies that have ever. Or no, I'm sorry, not Trump. Biden has some of the most progressive tax policies that have ever been suggested. Um, like in, in any person running for government, like in in 40 or 50 years, like um. And, and, and again, if we are worried about potentially all of these things happening under Biden, whatever we're worried about happening under Biden is literally happening under Trump right now. First of all, just because there's a trade imbalance, that has nothing to do with inequality in America. Inequality in America is going to be seen when you do things like in, uh, like disproportionately give tax cuts to wealthy people, which is what Trump has done. Um, like slash things like education spending, which disproportionately helps poor people, um, slash things like social programs, like getting rid of the mandate for the ACA and cutting off government funding for that. Like Trump has consistently time and time again, favored large corporations over American workers. Again, look at the PPP program. Like I know people that got, you know, almost no money because they were just making a little bit too much, but I know businesses that are getting, you know, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars because they qualify for, you know, some type of business reinvestment loan, regardless of how wealthy the owners are. Um, like, like to say that these things are favoring the workers um, is just absolutely not true. Um, and, and then, like when we talk about like how, how Trump has like dealt with things so far, you know, um, the, the tariffs have only hurt American workers. Um, we still continue to massively like in the first eighteen months of Trump's presidency, the rate of federal contractors offshoring jobs doubled. Um, and, and then and when we talk about like bringing back like manufacturing to the United States. Um, 
Biden literally has plans for all of this on his on his website. You can literally look at like joebiden.com slash made in America. And he's got like a whole plan for like $400 billion um, procurement investments for, you know, buy American, make American. Um, he wants to, you know, make a $300 billion investment in R&D for breakthrough technologies. Um, like he's got like all, like all of this shit is listed under Biden's plan. Trump has already proven that he's unwilling or unable to do any of this. He either doesn't have the political capital or the political will to do so. Um, American workers have not flourished under Trump. It's definitely going to take a long time to undo the neoliberal policies that have been done over the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years for sure. So, I mean, I don't think it can be done in one term or one presidency, even it's something that's going to take a lot more time. But just to go back to this, Joe Biden did say in a meeting on July, it was like July 20th. He said, corporate America has to change its ways. It's not going to require legislation. I'm not proposing any. We've got to think how to deal, how we deal people back in. He went on to say, um, he says, the, I'm not one of those guys who thinks government knows best, but let me tell you something. Think of what we can do in terms of investing in offshore wind. There's a lot of steel we can make. Man, a lot of people can be put, be put to work. A lot of CEOs can make a lot more money, and a lot of people can be paid a decent salary. He then says, the essence is that you've got to build the country back, build back better, give people an opportunity for a decent wage. And you guys might not like it, a union wage. That's my view. I hope I don't offend any of you with that, but I think it's totally consistent with a market economy moving forward. So he literally, that was his speech three weeks ago. He makes a lot of promises. I mean, look, um, if we're going to go with candidate Trump versus candidate Biden, I think then it would be, you know, we'd have to go back to what did Trump say during the campaign. We all know that he didn't actually live up to many of his promises in his, in his presidency. So I think it would be unwise to think that Biden, who's making all of these promises, is also going to then get into office and somehow magically live up to all of his campaign promises, especially since even during the campaign, he's actually flip-flopped and said one thing to the people and then another thing to corporate America. And he's done that time and time again. And you know he's got 50 years of governance that we can look at the record. We don't have to go with his campaign promises. I don't look at any of his campaign promises because I have 50 years of him in government. I've got four years of Trump and I have 50 years of Biden to look at. And I've seen that time and time again, he's basically been Republican light and he's sided with corporate America. He's sided with big crime. He's, uh, you know, he wrote the crime bill. He wrote the Patriot Act. I mean, the guy is a he's foreign policy. He's been for the invasion of, of Iraq. He's been uh, under Obama, you know, they went and toppled Gaddafi, turning Libya into a failed state where we have now an open slave market. He's been a disaster time and time again over 50 years of governance. So I think it's fair that we compare his actual record, not his promises, to Trump's actu actual record and not Trump's promises. I mean, Biden is not a perfect candidate, but literally for every single part you bring up that's bad with Biden, Trump has literally had a worse record. We don't have to just look at candidate Trump or President Trump. We can just look at historical Trump, right? When we talk about like wrote the crime bill, right? Biden had some important contributions to that crime bill that involved like historic protections for women from domestic violence and then a uh, ban on assault weapons. Like these were Biden's like huge contributions to the crime bill that he pushed so far. They made concessions to, to Republicans, sure, um, in order to uh, for like the top on crime policy and all of that stuff, which debatedly at the time a lot of people supported regardless anyway but like i mean trump has literally come out saying things um god what was the op-ed that he wrote on the um on those five oh god it was was it those five black kids that were killed or whatever or he, oh and, yeah the 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 central park five yeah. yeah oh my god like how can you read something like that and think man trump is a lot better on crime or, well i mean biden trump had a very similar stance at that time he was <laughs> quoted saying that he you know wanted extreme punishment for them very extreme. And he then roped them into 100,000 other youth. He was, he talked about a bunch of youth that were all around the country at that time that he was saying they needed to go really hard at these people. I, I would have to go back and read Biden's thing. I remember that he, he did have a negative view on them for sure, but I'm pretty sure Trump literally said in that op-ed that they should be executed or hung or something. It was yeah, like he, insane. Well, he called for the death penalty, yeah. sure. But you know, so, and also Trump, and also the difference, the time. a key difference here, because we like to do a lot with timelines. Trump held on to his position after the Central Park Five was acquitted. So, like, 
like that, that's a pretty big thing as well. Also, Trump is super buddy buddy with people like Arpeo um, from Arizona, um, and is a super big fan of things like stop and frisk or different types of things in New York City. Like, so the idea that like Trump has this better stance on crime, but we just don't know Trump's stance on crime. You know, um, I don't. I don't think this is true. You know, we talk about supporting the open slave market. Like Trump has plenty of support for the Gulf states, where we see lots of slave labor being imported into these countries. Um, I think Qatar and the UAE have had like people that are like imported. Fuck, we watched this. I think it was a Vice document or whatever, where like um, like twenty people live like in these four people shacks where they're brought over and basically treated as indentured servants um to work in some of these areas. Um, and and uh, yeah, I don't know this. I just, I mean, like there are things we can be critical of Biden for. I'm not going to sit here and stand Biden on every single issue. Of course, there are things that he that he has supported in the past and maybe even continues for that I wouldn't like. But in almost every single measure, um, you know, Trump supporting the World Cup and all the labor that went involved into that, like in almost every single measure, Trump has been just measurably worse. Then, I think, then, I, I then think it's fair to say, though, that if Trump were president during the time that we took out Gaddafi, I don't think that would have happened. I don't think Trump would have gone in and, and taken out Gaddafi. He's just such an he's just against that sort of intervention. America, look, you, we, we have this very uh, I, it's the Tulsi supporter. OK, we, we have this very anti-American intervention point of view where it's like, well, if America, you know, if we would have been anti-intervention, we wouldn't have messed up in Libya. Sure. But you know what else Trump would have done? He wouldn't have gone into Bosnia and ended the civil war there either. Not all American involvement in other countries is necessarily bad. There are times where we get it wrong, but there are also times where we get it right, too. I don't think it's fair to say that it, we should just pull out of every single foreign conflict and have no U.S. involvement whatsoever and just let Russia or China or any other country that wants to step and have involvement run their case there. I don't, I don't think it's fair to say that. And I also don't think it's fair to say that like, well, Trump wouldn't have gone in during that, uh, you know, during that civil war and done anything there when, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that you've accused the, the, the U.S. of being involved in regime change there because the, we thought that they were going to move away from the petrodollar. Well, we're literally running Syrian oil fields. Like ha, we obviously, Trump has a vested interest in what goes on with oil in other countries. Why wouldn't Trump intervene there if he thought it was going to benefit um, the, the U.S. oil markets? Or why wouldn't he go in there if he thought that there was some economic advantage to begin there? We literally did it in, in, in Syria in an escalation an attempt under Obama, like, or I'm sorry, under um, under uh, Trump, like, like we did under Bush. We didn't do this under Obama. Um, I, I, have a, I have a hard time seeing, I don't know, man, I like sticking Trump into other timelines and then trying to evaluate how he would act there based on how he's acted here. It seems impossible to me that Trump would have been any more responsible. Um, it, like Trump, we bombed Syria under Trump. We bombed one of their airports, literally. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm yeah, not that was just, it. I mean, that was a response, right? We were trying to respond to a chemical, you know, uh, uh, an accused, an accusation of a chemical attack. So, That's why we helped invade Syria. That's why we were supporting, it was a response to chemical weapon attacks under Obama. Why do we support it when Trump does it, but we didn't support it when Obama did it? Well, it wasn't an invasion. I mean, he bombed an empty airport. He, I mean, there was, that was all it was. It was just, it was for show. It was similar to what Iran did after Soleimani was killed. They sort of did a show thing. I mean, that's all it was, was a show. It wasn't real. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't something that actually led to massive loss of life or endless amounts of war or American troops on the ground for years on end. Um, you know, and what, what we do know is that Venezuela, for example, is about oil as well. And, you know, Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world that we know of. And he has not attempted to affect regime change in the same way. So I just think, you know, with Bosnia, it's hard to say that, of course, was a humanitarian crisis. And, uh, and that is one of very few actual humanitarian crises that we've seen in our lifetime, where it really was absolutely necessary for our government to go in. Um, People but made the same argument for Libya. Been, what's that? People made the same argument for Libya. They make they the were... argument for all of that. I mean, that's been the the war machine's talking point is to try to get people into uh, this sort of bleeding heart situation of we have to we have to protect humanitarian rights and uh, that's what that's what Biden is now arguing against for Venezuela. Trump now saying, hey, you know, I'm willing to sit down with Maduro. Why not? I think this is kind of a loss, so we should just kind of move on from this. And Biden saying, oh no, absolutely not. We have a, a we have a humanitarian crisis and we're for humanity and. This is There's the right human, thing human, to do: is to go and affect regime change. It's always do been we not the believe, right thing to do. Do we not believe that humanitarian crises has ever happened? Like I'm, I'm assuming you think no, they the happen. Like crisis, I just said, yeah, but in Bosnia, in Bosnia they, they happen, yeah. sure, but they weren't right. happening. Libya. Two. Are they happening right now in China with the Uyghurs? Do we believe that that's happening? I don't. What about the humanitarian? You don't believe in that, okay? What about the humanitarian right. crisis in Yemen that Trump is continuing to push for war in? Like, well, that's Saudi Arabia. We've been funding them. Yeah, that is an absolute crisis that no, needs hold on. to end. That's Trump. The United States right. is explicitly supporting, and Trump himself vetoed the Senate 
trying to, to withdraw any actions there. Like that is those right. are U.S. drones shooting yep. U.S. missiles onto Yemeni citizens. Like we can't just blame Saudi Arabia for that. This is U.S. involvement. Like I mean, there are humanitarian crises happening. It's not like they never happen. We just I believe there was a story yesterday or maybe it was this morning of a, a Canadian man died, I think, on our northern border of COVID-19 because he was locked in like a U.S. detention center. Um, or, or we had these kids in cages at, at the southern border being separated from their families like during our immigration. Like, we haven't even touched on the coronavirus handling. Um, I mean, oh, man. I don't know. I, I, well, yeah, I mean, this could go on for a long time. I don't know. I, I'll give you the last word if you want to think. Well, I mean, just when it comes to that, for sure, there's humanitarian crises. I don't, I don't disagree with that. I don't think, you know, Libya turned into a major humanitarian crisis after we took out Gaddafi and turned the place into a failed state with a, with an open slave trade. So I don't know how we could justify saying this was a, a, a something we must do in order to protect the Libyan people and it actually did completely the opposite. Most of our regime change efforts have, in fact, like look at Afghanistan when we marched in there and we were affecting all kinds of attempts at regime change, Iraq. Look at what's happened to these people. They've ended up with the Taliban. They've ended up with, uh, you know, with Syria when we were attempting regime change there. They ended up with a surge of ISIS that Russia had to come in and say, hey, uh, we now have to battle ISIS because ISIS has now reared its ugly head because of your guys' attempted regime change. So we haven't really been very good. Our track record of saving nations because of a humanitarian crisis is really, really, our, our, we get an F on that for sure. So I don't, that, I think everybody, especially on the left, the many, many people on the left and right are waking up on this, but those on the left who always historically have claimed to be for less war uh, need to wake up to the fact that these so-called humanitarian regime change efforts are in fact not that, but making humanitarian situations much worse. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, the only I said I give you the last word. The only thing I want to say about all that is, for the record, Trump was a massive supporter of intervention in Libya. That's something that Hillary Clinton brought up that was true. We will jump into the q and want to say thanks so much, folks, for all of your questions and a quick friendly reminder that both Destiny and Kim are linked in the description. What are you waiting for? If you want to hear more, now is the chance. So let's jump into those questions. want to say thanks so much, folks, for all of these. The first one, this one comes in, and do I understand right that Soch Dem, is that synonymous, just in abbreviation for democratic socialism? Yeah, I think so. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. Thought so. Wanted to be sure. It said, UK Marxism DLC failed. Says, Destiny, if we accept that democratic socialism is preferred to any other capitalist system, why are you against socialism when democratic socialism predicates socialism by theory? De democratic socialism? I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm a sock dem, not a dem sock. There's a difference. Oh, okay. uh, sock dem is like a social democracy which is where basically it's a, it's a, it is explicitly a capitalist run system that has like a lot of government intervention. Democratic socialism is a non-capitalist, non-market system. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a dem sock at all. I'm a sock dem. Gotcha. Okay. Let me just be sure that, thanks for that clarification, by the way, that, okay, that, that helps a lot. Okay. I definitely screwed that up. Sorry about that. They said destiny. If we accept that, Sockdom is preferred to any other capitalist system. Why are you against socialism when Sockdom predicates oh, socialism it's a, by It's theory. a bad question. A Sockdom is a capitalist system. So social democracy is a capitalist system. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for that. And your good buddy, your twin Vosh, says all presidents are puppets. Says Biden is weak and easier to manipulate than Trump from a progressive perspective. Become the puppet master. Hashtag bully Biden. Are we supposed to respond to that? Or? If you'd like, you can. <laughs> sure. The, I, I agree mean, the with people that. that. The people that Biden would choose to pull his strings, I'm probably going to be more in favor of than the people that Trump would choose. I'd rather have whatever pulling Biden's strings than Bolton or somebody like that pulling Trump's strings. Gotcha. And if you if you had anything to add, Kim, I was thinking it was more targeted toward Destiny, but oh, my yeah, old. I mean, <laughs> go ahead. I don't think Trump has, I mean, I think Trump is mercurial and he changes his mind a lot. I don't think people are actually uh, pulling his strings. I don't think Trump is a puppet. I think he's just 
changes his mind on a whim a lot you know he'll listen to some people and he'll be like okay i agree with that and then he'll kind of move forward with that a little bit and then he'll say oh wait no i changed my mind i don't like that anymore i think that's why they want to get rid of him i think that's why many of the establishment have been really uncomfortable with him because he's not as easy to gauge or manipulate biden on the other hand i do think is totally and completely going to be manipulated Gotcha. Miles Kinslow, thanks for your question, said, Hey guys, I honestly can't take the Biden seriously. He seems confused. This does go back to a, a, something that came up during the conversation earlier. Is that, Destiny, I know that you had said, well, we can't really, from these like sound bites, it's hard to know where he is psychologically. And I guess that probably pertains to this. Maybe I adding mean, both candidates are insanely fucking old. Like Biden and Trump both seem like they're on a fucking cognitive landslide. I, I mean, I, I but for me to say here and try to guess like, oh, like he's in stage four dementia, blah blah. Like I think it's really cringy. Like it's hard to say. Um, and again, like I said, like if I, I mean, I think that the choice is between Trump and Biden. There's no realistic third party candidate right now. Um, I would rather have Biden's cabinet and Biden's runner up than Trump's cabinet and his vice president. So. Gotcha. And Comrade Courtney, thanks for your question, said, Hey, Destiny, are you aware of the situation with progressive, quote unquote, crystal ball and her subtle endorsement of far right populists? Like, let me know if I mispronounce this. Sagar, S-A-G, hey, thank you. And Tucker Carlson. If so, what are your thoughts? It's cringe as fuck. Any lefty, I've seen a lot of lefties that go into this weird path where they get like, um, enticed by Tucker Carlson's populist rhetoric and they ignore all the racialized stuff. It's really weird, but you know. Well, he's definitely, he has a lot of bad racial takes for sure. I mean, there, you know, there's like suspicion about that guy when it comes to that, but his populist takes are quite left. So I could see why well, a lot populist. of- I mean, populism can be either left or right, right? Right. Gotcha. And Stephen Steen, thanks for your super chat. Appreciate it. Fabian Dillon, thanks for yours. Also said, thank you for this debate, everyone. Super entertaining. Love listening to these. And much love. God bless. Thank you, Fabian, for your support. And all credit to Kim and Destiny. This is, honestly, we've got a ton of positive feedback. I hope you guys know that. On this side in the chat, people have really enjoyed listening to you guys. Tasty Therian, thanks for your question, said, to Kim, what specifically on foreign policy is Trump better than Biden with? Oh, I feel like I went through a bunch of that. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I feel like I went through a bunch of that on. I, the, the, I would say the one thing I think he's not better on is Iran and Israel, but Israel's to be debated because I'm not sure how Biden would act once he gets into the White House with Israel. It's possible he'll just be similar on that front. But gotcha. Iran, for sure, Trump is worse at. But I feel like I went through all of the rest of them. You bet. And Marcus Aurelius, thanks for your question, says, Destiny, please be stoic, Steve, and read the meditations. Got it. Okay. Must be one of your buddies. I don't know. So uh, uh, maybe I, that even mean? <laughs> I don't know if it's the real Marcus Aurelius. Okay, stupid whore energy. <laughs> stupid whore energy. Thanks for your question. Says, I was just wondering how much the Kremlin is paying Kim Iverson for her efforts to try to split the vote in favor of Trump. Oh, well, here we go with Russia Gate, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Next. Yeah, uh, <laughs> loads of money. I'm becoming a millionaire as we speak. Well, hope, to be fair, you did receive some money from a um, Syrian funded foundation, right? For some of the work that you've done. Yeah. There were, you know, I don't know where, if they were funded by Syria, you know, that was something that some investigative journalists said that these people were somehow connected to Syria. Um, I won an award that was gifted to many of us independent journalists, and I was never told why I won the award, like for which coverage in particular. And I was never told to like, that was it. I was never said, they never influenced or said anything. I literally don't know for which coverage. I only figured out the coverage later when I actually had an opportunity to meet with one of the members of that, um, of that fund. And he was Iranian and he was specifically discussing my coverage on Iran. So I don't, you know, I heard that, but those of us that received it said, I mean, all of us have the same. We, we were not even contact. We don't know who, we didn't know anything. It was completely, um, for us, they didn't come and say, hey, we like your coverage on Syria. Here's an award. That just didn't happen. They didn't say anything. Okay. 
Dasha and Antsy Sorvisto, thanks for your encouragement, said, It's been amazing. Keep it up. This has been truly amazing. I couldn't agree more. And it also reminded me of something I want to mention, just to clarify for the, both the sake of Kim and Destiny, that originally... And this is both, everybody's on the same page where over the emails, it originally started with like Trump versus Biden, and then it evolved through emails, both Destiny and Kim did know coming into this, that it was kind of like, eh, more like, is it Biden or never Biden? And that's something that I just really didn't up, uh, you could say I didn't really upgrade or update that on the thumbnail. So I just want to let you know that that's kind of why the conversation has been way more centered on Biden today. And Factitionalist Network, thanks for your question, said Destiny... Do you think that there is similarity in your logic between your position against third party support and Pascal's wager? No. I, know, I think Pascal's wager is a really stupid um, argument anyway. Next. Thank you for that. Tyler Preston, your question says Obama orders drone strikes in the Middle East that killed over 500, including children gets a Nobel Peace Prize, while Trump arranges for a peaceful negotiation with Iran and gets labeled as a mega-Satan. I think that's for you, Destiny, if you... Uh... I mean, I don't know what I'm... I mean, like, I'm, like the amount of drone strikes that we did in Yemen increased um, under Trump. Um, I, don't, I don't support Obama's um, actions in Syria or Yemen. Um, I think we should maybe take a little bit of a harsher stance towards um, people in the Gulf states, although admittedly that's a very complicated issue. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to sit here and support like any type of like war in Yemen. Like the prior administration that was there was corrupt as fuck, and Saudi support for people there is, is pretty fucked. But understandably, Saudi doesn't want Saudi Arabia doesn't want a country to the south of them that has leadership that's loyal to <laughs> um, to to Iran. So I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a rough one. Gotcha. And thanks for your question. This one comes in from Stupid Whore Energy Strikes Again. She says, Trump hasn't has not gotten us into any new wars because his advisors were scared to give him military options due to the fact that he's so unhinged. Kim, I think there's a challenge for you. So wait, what was it again? Sorry. They said the only reason that Trump hasn't gotten us into any new wars was because his advisors were scared to give him military options open to that due to the fact that he's so unhinged. Oh. oh, no, they gave him plenty. I mean, when Bolton was there, he was trying to talk him into all kinds of wars. He was trying to talk him into Iran. He was trying to talk into into, into uh, more military intervention into Venezuela. Um, they've absolutely tried to talk him into wars. He's just refused, which is what Bolton lays out in his book. Gotcha. And let's see. Rumpley Depew, I'm sorry, I, you're, I appreciate your super chat. Let's see, it's more, it seems more personally oriented, so we're going to pass it. Our father in the green, thanks for your super chat, said, and that one's, that last one's gray, so it's kind of like, I'm being strict. De they said, Destiny, do you seriously trust the DNC to carry out, quote, most progressivism, the most progressive platform? And do you think that Biden and his admins should be one term only? I mean, how you carry your stuff out is going to depend on the composition of Congress. Like, the president doesn't have that much deference to just unilaterally. Well, I guess unless you try to abuse EOs like crazy, like I guess Trump has when citing tariffs as like national security measures and stuff. Uh, but like generally, like you, you need popular support to do it. If the Democrats want to be able to get their agenda passed, then they can't just winning the presidency isn't enough. You have to win that House and Congress as well or the House and the Senate as well. So gotcha. it, it'll, it'll come down to those elections, basically, to see how much of any particular person's agenda can get passed. Gotcha. And Bricks, thanks for your question. Said, Destiny, when advocating for Biden, do you find it most difficult to speak to right-leaning or far-left, never-Biden-type people? Do they have significantly different reasons for disliking Biden? Uh, I don't know. I think most of the reasons why people get for disliking Biden are usually this assumption that Biden and Trump are similar on things, which, and I, that was kind of what we opened this, like this vague, like, reference to neoliberalism. But I, but I think when it comes to policy, I think Biden and Trump almost couldn't be more different in some ways. So I, I don't know. It's, usually I just get down into policy discussions like, well, what, what policies do they support? And then I feel like you see like pretty big differences between the two. Gotcha. Let's see. Let's say UK Marxism DLC failed. Thanks for your question. I think it's partially in, in jest, but also 
They said the fact that Biden is your best bet is satire in real life. True or Trump? Very funny. But would you say, so Destiny, all things being equal, if you didn't have Trump as the alternative, like on a scale of one to 10, I'm curious, like, and we could do this for each of you, like how much do you like Biden on a scale of one to 10 in, you could say kind of in a vacuum without Trump as the only alternative? Um, I, th I think he's okay. He gets the job done. I like, I have my economic positions and everything I, I feel are like very data driven. And I feel like most people don't care, care about like what data driven economic positions are anymore. It's generally all like appeasing some popular rhetoric. So I don't know. In that sense, I'm not too thrilled about him. but there's no politician that I think really looks to like data driven answers on problems. So I don't know. I, I mean, he's, I, he's as good, I guess, as the Democrats have been doing this, whatever. Gotcha. And Layman, thanks for your question, said, Kim, what's your definition of quote, neoliberal unquote definition of, le of neoliberal so um for me that would be definitely opening up um free trade just complete free trade you know just um ignoring any sort of control measures on banks or corporations or trade gotcha i would say is more neoliberal and beyonce had one of the best I can't read the rest of your, your name is too long. But they said, these debates should be two hours plus one hour of Q&A should go point by point. But if not, then you, James, should moderate interruptions better. We like giving our critics a voice. <laughs> so thanks for that. We'll seriously consider it. We appreciate that. That was the only criticism earlier. They said, oh, they talked too long. And that was a super chat we skipped. But uh, like I said, it's true. We, I mean, we're pretty spontaneous. We like just kind of let it go with the flow. And so, but yes, I will, I'll consider that. Dwayne Burke, thanks for your question. Appreciate it. And Tioga, thank you for yours. Said, remember when Destiny laughed at Vietnam for, quote, losing to capitalism? Has he changed his stance on American imperialism since talking to Luna? Never. First of all, Luna's a fucking moron, but I never laughed at Vietnam for losing to America. I just said that if you're going to give the excuse that, well, socialism doesn't work because capitalist countries always destroy socialist countries, then I said, well, I don't want to be part of a socialist country that gets destroyed by a capitalist country. That's not a good argument. That's all I said. Gotcha. Ray S., thanks for your question, said, we briefly touched the... Let me know if I mispronounce this. Y Uyghur? Uyghur? Uyghur. Uyghur, Uyghur. Uyghur, thank you issue earlier i know kim has some interesting takes on the matter can we elaborate on it <laughs> that's a long answer but i'll try to do my best to make it short uh, long story short with the uyghur issue in china is that china made the same mistake the united states made back in the 70s of uh, arming training and facilitating uh, extremists in order to defeat Russia. So China also had this, oh, Russia is going to come get us. So the United States did it with Al Qaeda when we were in Afghanistan in the 70s and 80s when we were um, we were arming and uh, training the Mujahideen, which ultimately ended up becoming Al Qaeda and Taliban and you know all of these different factions. And so China made that same mistake, and um, so they're seeing, they've seen a, a major rise in extremism in that region of the country. And these are not, you know, here in America, a lot of times when we see extremists or whatever, we say, oh, we'll just deport them. Well, China doesn't have that option. They are Chinese, they are, but they are extreme in their ideology for Islam. Um, Islam ha is not, you know, there are some factions that are just really extreme inside, just like there are extreme factions inside Christianity and whatnot. So they're trying to figure out a creative way to get control over that extremist ideology and you know, criticize it all you want. I don't think anybody's come up with a really good solution. Our solution has been bombing. Our solution has been going in and murdering people in order to get them to change their ways. China's trying to take this different approach of maybe we can reprogram them by putting them into uh, re-education camps. That being said, my grandfather went to a re-education camp. I am Vietnamese. My grandfather was put into a four-year re-education camp. So it's like not lost, on, you know, not lost on me what a re-education camp, it, it, you know, the, the whole concept of it is pretty, it's common in Asia, I should say. 
Gotcha. And thank you for elaborating on that. And then our right, father. So just to be clear, so we uh, we believe it's happening. We're just okay with it. Is essentially your answer, right? Well, I just don't think it's what people think it is necessarily. I, I think that you know you'd want to re-educate people who have extremist ideology, right? So you'd want to figure like... out a way, to, rather than harm them or fight them, you'd want to try to figure out a way to try to re-educate people out of really extremist ideology. Do you believe that they're like separating children from their families and everything in order to put children into re-education camps and whatnot? Yeah, probably. You... Yeah, probably. They're probably doing that. That's like. An I option. mean, it's not I, w like to me. What's the alternative to bomb them? I don't think that's moral either. I don't know. I what I don't think we've come up with a good solution for battling extremism for Islamic extremism. It's very different than white nationalist extremism here in the United States you know, Islamic extremism, they're able to raise armies, full on armies and take over complete regions of the world. So it's a real serious threat. And I don't know if anybody in the world has come up with a really good solution. I know that like Denmark said, well, maybe we should stick them all on an island and isolate them and let them have that out there. You know, I mean, I don't think anyone's come up with a really good solution. That is China's solution. I do think it's better than bombing them. Are all are these millions of Uyghurs? All of them are extremists and require the they, eradication of their culture, or? Well, many of them. I there. It's. I'm not 100% certain, but if they're following Wahhabism, then yes. And Wahhabism has, because of Saudi Arabia's oil money, has been able to go and export this version of it's a it's a perverted version of Islam around the world using a lot of money. And they build mosques. They train imams. They then. Uh, export a very radical version of Islam that, quite frankly, for people in the Middle East who are not Wahhabists, are very frightened of it. Gotcha. And next question. This one comes in from our father in the green. Says, does Destiny see it as an imperative to replace Biden and his administration successors with legit progressives in leadership in 2024, thus killing two birds with one stone. We don't even know right now what the fuck is going to happen in five months. I'm not looking ahead past that. Like, I, like anything can happen in, in the coming months. Um, it, it'll depend on how Biden's presidency goes. I have a hard time imagining anybody in their 80s running for re-election. Jesus fuck, but I, I guess it could happen. That seems. I don't think uh, he's going to rerun. I think he already said he wasn't going to, right? Um, I remember that uh, during the election, I think he said something about that. I don't know if that's been brought up again, but, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Gotcha. And Robert Luscombe, thanks for your question, said, Kim, you are supporting a man who literally prefers letting people die so he can get reelected. Example, not wanting sufficient testing because he feels the number of COVID-19 cases makes him look bad. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't know if, I, I think it's, I think you could say that, you could connect some dots and, and say, well, he'd rather people die, but I don't think that's really what he's saying, or really, I, I think that's sort of a, you know, sort of straw manning his, his position, I don't know, I think COVID is a whole different animal and a whole different beast, and I'm not sure if anyone could really get, it's been a disaster all around the world, with many leaders all around the world, have only been some select areas that seem to have done better than others so in this country even i think it's a disaster i mean california where i live we have a democratic governor we've been under lockdown for a long time we've had masks orders for a long time and it's still rising and spiking here i mean COVID is like a whole different beast um and i know a lot of people will probably judge trump on based on COVID. i don't think his response was good i also think you know, because I think he could have rallied the troops up a bit, let's say, and 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 gone full throttle in in uh, production of masks and telling people to wear masks. And uh, I'm not the testing thing. I think we had an issue with getting the materials, and we needed to get those from another country. I think that's one of the challenges. Same with some medications needed to come from India. They weren't willing to ship them out. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I think that, uh, like I said, shined a light on the fact that we are too import heavy as a nation, but. We do have to remember, we're not really a nation, we're a federation. And that federation of 50 governors, all 50 governors got to do what they wanted to do. It's like herding cats, trying to get all of them on the same page for some sort of response. So I don't know, I mean, um, it's a tough one. I don't think, I, but I don't think anybody really, I mean, I, I guess you could say the same thing that another candidate is wanting people to die 
you know, you could say Biden wants people to die in Venezuela because he wants to go and do regime change in Venezuela in order to get votes from people. Gotcha. I guess you could say that about anybody. And General Balzac, thanks for your question, said, would Biden's, this is, both of you are, you can answer this, I think this would be really interesting. They said, would Biden's selection for VP change your stance on whether or not you will vote for him, and in particular, of those who would be plausible VP candidates? Is there someone uh, that would change your mind about Biden? Biden could almost resurrect fucking Hitler at this point, and it'd still be preferable to Trump's for like everything related to his presidency. Um, not literally, but like realistically, I don't think there's a person that Trump could, um, or I'm sorry, I don't think there's a person that Biden could um, nominate as his VP that would make me more likely to want to vote for um, Trump. I, I, I just can't see that happening. Um, I think that the talk I've heard floated around a lot is actually Kamala Harris, um, which wouldn't be anywhere near enough to dissuade me from voting for uh, Biden. So. Gotcha. Yeah, for me, I mean, Biden, um, you know, he could win my vote if he were to select as his vice president pick either Bernie Sanders or or Tulsi Gabbard. So if he were to go in that direction, I know he's not going to, but if he woke up today and decided that he was going to make an announcement, it was going to be Bernie or Tulsi, I think he could win my vote. But gotcha. otherwise, Kamala Harris, for sure, he's not going to win my vote. Or Susan been... Rice, for sure not. For sure. And Gamer Haney, thanks for your question. We've only got several more. Said, Kim, what are your thoughts on the value of multiculturalism in a democracy? Well, well, I mean, it's to me very important. I'm half Asian, half, you know, I'm half Danish, half Vietnamese. So I'm all about multiculturalism. Um, I definitely, you know, that is the one downside for conservative, you know, many downsides. I don't agree really with Republicans on anything. Um, and one of the, I would say that neoliberals have been pretty much the same as conservatives, except they have added multiculturalism into their platform more than conservatives have you know that's one of their differences their other differences would be climate and uh used to be more on foreign policy but i think that's now been taken by the trump side of things so you know multiculturalism is really important for sure yeah you bet and so wara thanks for your question said kim what one thing would be the most influential in changing your mind about biden Um, like I said, if he were to select Bernie or Tulsi as his VP pick, two people that I could trust more, you know, then I would, that would definitely change my mind. Um, but other than that, to me, it's just a wash between the two. I just think they're both really bad. I'm not going to vote for either of them. And yeah, so I, maybe if he, like his VP pick, I guess, because I don't think he's going to be in office for three i think he's got three two and a half years and then they're going to move the vp in gotcha and talison oberlander thanks for your question said and i'm wondering destiny is this like a meme at your channel or is this they say destiny i'm obligated to inform you you're white yeah that's it that's <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I don't know. Blue lines. For some reason, when you're making fun of people, if you tell them they're white, they get really fucking mad. Whether they're not white or whether they are white, it just makes everybody really mad. I don't know, so <laughs> what? <laughs> Blue lens. Thanks for your question. Said, can Kim expand upon her numerous comments about Israel and what is Destiny's stance on Israel as well? So Israel, like I, you know, the United States and Israel have this um, really strong alliance. And it's it's an alliance that is beneficial in both ways. So for Israel, they get the protection. You know, they've made best friends with the largest military might in the world, which allows them to be protected, considering that they're in uh, they're in a backyard of the world that doesn't want them there. So for them, it's really important to have the United States as their ally, and because of that, they've been able to. Um, gained quite a bit of influence in our political sphere uh, through a variety of different ways. And so in a lot of ways, we help them out by doing things that they want done, like picking fights in the Middle East and destabilizing regions. And that's why we're picking a fight with Iran is because Israel and Iran have a big beef with one another. And 
Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of their bidding and in, in exchange, they do some for us too. They do things that we are not legally able to do because of our constitution or conventions that we've signed, pacts we've signed. And so we have this sort of military arm that can get away with a lot of bad things that we ourselves cannot. So it works out in both favor and it's, uh, it's something that, you know, we're supporting them with a ton of money that Americans should be more aware of and really questioning that alliance just as much as America is questioning our alliance with Saudi Arabia. Gotcha. Agreement, Destiny, or? Um, yeah, I mean, largely, like, the U.S. wants allies in the Middle East. Um, if you're ever looking for, like, why is the U.S. doing this? Like, usually the answer is, well, because some ally, there's some U.S. interest in that region that could be an ally that we're either implicitly or explicitly defending. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Israel has very negative opinions towards Iran. Iran has very negative opinions towards Israel. Um, Iran's support of Hezbollah in Lebanon is obviously not something that, um, and then by extension, that Hamas is obviously something that Israel is not very thrilled with. Uh, but Iran also, um, as Kim pointed out, fights with Saudi Arabia a lot as well. Um, just recently, um, I mean, what we've seen, like the limpet mine stuff, we've seen the drone attacks on the oil rigs and everything. Like, yeah, the back and forth between those two countries. Um, has it has been a lot yeah I, I mean the u.s has interest in the region that we want to defend and so we work for their bidding or if you don't believe that then there's like the jewish overmind conspiracy shit or whatever but yeah i think that the simple explanation is just that the u.s is interested in having allies in that region israel's an ally in that region you bet and matthew Steele, last question of the day so they had asked my guess is it's probably been clear i guess maybe we wouldn't know for sure between tulsi or or Bernie, but they had asked him, who is your ideal candidate for president this year and why? Gabbard is my, was my ideal pick um, and still is, and I'll probably write in her name, quite honestly. So the reason is because she's very progressive left of even Bernie Sanders on all of her policies. She's fighting for clean water, clean air, um, obviously, she's very against all of these regime change wars. She's been against um, the interventionism and and continuing escalations and Cold War escalations. And um, she's just all around. She's a, a true leftist candidate is what I would say with Tulsi, a true leftist. And we haven't seen one of those. She's even more left than Bernie. So, but at the same time, appealing to the some people on the right populist right winger i think she would have been a fantastic candidate that would have brought in a lot of those people that are more libertarian that are on the right and i think she absolutely would have been the one candidate that could have actually defeated donald trump gotcha and want to say thanks everybody for hanging out with us do want to give you a quick reminder in case you forgot if you have not already been able to visit destiny or kim's channels they're linked in the description so you've got to at least check it out give it a try and so want to say thanks so much though destiny and kim it's been a true pleasure to have you like i said people have really enjoyed this it's been a great time yeah, thank you so Absolutely. With that, folks, we hope you have a great, great weekend. We are excited as we will have on a lot of debates in the future, and we hope you feel welcome for those debates. No matter what walk of life you're from, folks, we really do hope you feel welcome, and so hopefully we'll see you for some of those. And otherwise, keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable, folks, and have a great rest of your weekend.